Great. Okay, I'd like to welcome everyone to session six of Learning Creative Learning. Uh, it's great to, have, uh, to be back. And this week, you know, the theme of the week is social creativity. And really happy to have with us, uh, joining us now in our Google Hangout, we have Gerhard Fischer from University of Colorado and Andres Monroe Hernandez, who now works at Microsoft Research. And I want to give a special appreciation to them because both of them happen to be traveling. And they're each traveling further west, so they had to wake up even earlier than normal. Gerhard usually is in Boulder, Colorado, but he's now in California, so he had to wake up at 7 a.m. And Andres, who's normally in Seattle, work for Microsoft, is in Hawaii, so he woke up at 4 a.m. to join us uh, for this conversation. So I really appreciate both of them, both taking time away while on vacation and getting up particularly early. Um, so before diving into conversation with Gerhard and Andres, just to reflect a little about on the last couple of weeks in learning creative learning. For myself, I spent the last couple of weeks at a couple of conferences. Over the last two weeks, I uh, visited the SIGSI conference in Denver, Colorado. In fact, spent some time with Gerhardt while I was in Colorado. And then last week, I was in Chicago at the Digital Media and Learning Conference. And at both of those conferences, learning creative learning was quite a bit on my mind. Partly because I met with some of you at both conferences, people came up to me and talked about how they were following the course. It was great to hear directly from some of you who have been participating. Uh, I know um, like Michelle Thorne from Mozilla came up to me at the DML conference and mentioned how she had been watching on her own, but then tweeted about it and found other people in Berlin that she could now gain together with and work and watching together. So it's great how people are starting to you know, link together with others in the course, which is a big part of what we're hoping for, to bring community together around the course. And this idea of community was also on my mind as I listened to a lot of the talks at the Sig C conference and digital media and learning. Uh, these days, if you go to a, a conference about education and learning, there's always lots of discussion around MOOCs. And that was you know, certainly the case both in the sessions themselves and in the hallways in conversations between sessions. Lots of people are talking about MOOCs and online courses. So it def definitely led to a lot of reflections about this course. And people are starting to refine and starting to think about some of the differences between different approaches to online courses. Uh, but you know, a lot of the mainstream and traditional MOOCs are really focused on trying to bring instruction to larger numbers of people. And, but there are different approaches to MOOCs, and people are even starting to give terminology to this. People are referring to X MOOCs about those traditional MOOCs that are delivering instruction. And some people are talking about C MOOCs for more collaborative, collective, connected MOOCs, where the main goal is really to connect people together and sort of to bring community together. Uh, and I really see that's where learning creative learning fits in. And we're continuing to think about that of how to organize a type of online course that really focuses on bringing community together. And we see in looking at the Google Plus community over the last couple of weeks, a lot of you have been discussing those issues as well. I saw one post from Fred Bartels, uh, who had actually been modeling the course using Google SketchUp. And then there's a video, if you search online, you'll see the way that he's been modeling the forms of interactions that are taking place in learning creative learning. And I do think this is a useful thing for us to be thinking about what are the ways we can apply the ideas of this course to the to, uh, online courses themselves? And that's one of the things I see that uh, you know, Fred was trying to do with some of the modeling that he's doing. And we're continuing to try to experiment to come up with ways we can explore the space of what these types of collaborative MOOCs might be. Uh, this week, we'll try a few more experiments. A lot of you have been you know, giving us feedback that you're worried that our approach has been a bit too traditional, that it's a lot of just you know, you know, delivering information by video. So we will be trying a couple new things this week. And they're just incremental changes, but in the spirit of the experimentation of the course, one thing is we'll do a little more media. Rather than just talking heads, we will be showing some slides to accompany Andres and Gerhardt. They sent me slides ahead of time. Uh, to try to connect more with some visuals around the discussions we're having. We're going to experiment with a little more participatory activity. Uh, in the course we're going to spend today, we're going to spend a little time with you having some conversations with each other about some of the themes. More on that later. And we're also going to experiment uh, with an extended chat. 
I know a lot of you have been enjoying the chat interactions during this session, but a few people did suggest, how about continuing the chat afterwards, after the conversation, and to have the panelists be joining in the chat so that the participants in the class can have some direct conversation with them. So we organized it, it this way, and uh, Gerhard and Andres were uh, both generous enough with their time to agree to stay on. So if you stay on at candy.media.mit.edu, at the end of the session, you'll be able to have some time chatting directly with Andres and Gerhard, following up on some of the discussion that we've had during the session itself. We'd love to get your feedback because we want to continue to experiment, try new things. So let us know how it goes, and we'll keep trying new things in the coming weeks. So maybe diving into the, this week's theme of social creativity, I know that uh, oftentimes when I've heard Gerhard talk about this theme, he uses uh, a, 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 an image that I often sometimes also point to. That's the image of Rodin's thinker. And a lot of times if you ask people about thinking, this is the image that comes to their mind, Rodin's thinker. It's a really iconic image and you know, a great statue. But I think in, when we think about thinking, uh, this isn't the image that comes to our mind. And I think sometimes this image of Rodin's thinker has really limited the ways people think about thinking and think about creativity. You know, Rodin's thinker really focuses on the isolated thinker, someone thinking by themselves, uh, not in contact with any media or other materials. And certainly that's one thing we've been talking about in this class, the ways that we can sort of connect with different media and how that can sort of support us in learning and creating in different ways by you know, connecting with other media, but also connecting with other people. It's not just about an individual thinker, but thinking in connection with others. And that's really going to be the theme of today's session, how we can move beyond that image of Rodin's thinker and really think about the activity of thinking and the activity of creativity and where the, how we can bring in a social dimension in thinking about those ideas. And we're going to start off in talking about the activity that a lot of you participated in this week. A lot of you had the opportunity uh, to dive in and experiment with remixing in the Scratch online community. Um, and I pulled up a few of the quotes that I saw in the Google Plus community from your experiences in remixing with Scratch. We have Eileen Hurley said, I found remixing in other people's work on Scratch a much more valuable place to start as a learner. My first attempt with Scratch earlier in the course was discouraging. I wasn't able to accomplish much. And she goes on to say that the scaffolding provided by remixing really made it uh, a more appealing and supportive way for her to get started creating with Scratch. And then there was a quote from uh, Mary Lee Heller who says, remixing is fun. No matter how small and aesthetic my addition of the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow bow feels to me, I had fun adding it and enhancing the great work others had done. So again, feeling of sort of building on the work of others was something she found very satisfying. Even just to make a small change was still very satisfying. And one last quote that uh, Cecilia Trevino starts by saying that just finishing her remix and feels so proud of herself, but she does go on to say, I found this actually challenging. Uh, and I asked for help from my daughter, a 12-year-old who uses Scratch. Uh, but again, there's so, it's not that even if people are enjoying you know, remixing, it's challenging as well, trying to take a look at someone else's code, making sense of it uh, is not so easy. And knowing you know, where to dive in and start, even if there are 3 million projects on the Scratch website, what are the different ways people can engage as participants is a real challenge for people. Uh, and this idea of different ways of engaging in participation in community is one of the themes we'll be talking about today and that you read about in the paper that Ger of Gerhardt's paper that we shared. But let me start, you know, since you had experience with this Scratch remixing this week, we're fortunate to have with us Andres, who really was the architect of the Scratch online community. He developed the Scratch website when we launched it a little over five years ago. And in his research, he specifically focused on remixing in Scratch. So maybe I'll start with Andres talking about, obviously, remixing is not a new idea in Scratch. Maybe you can talk a little bit about the inspirations for you in supporting and studying remixing, remixing in other media, and then how you see it, the effect it had in bringing it to Scratch. So Andres, right. So as you mentioned, um, I worked on 
the design of the online community when we first started and I was really inspired by can you hear me yeah we but it's coming through the, you're can you coming through a little bit warbled so we're going to experiment a little bit to see if we can what are you going to suggest Peter yeah, so maybe try just the audio. Maybe uh, just cut your video for a moment and see if the audio comes across better. We're having trouble with the audio. And, but All right. Sorry can about the me? pause. But yeah, Andres, we can hear you fine now. So Andres, we have sure. your slide up now. Uh, All hopefully, right. you can, hopefully you can see. I, see, I do see uh, the see corner a of bit. it. <laughs> so so yes. maybe talk a little bit about, give, talk about your inspirations about remixing. Sure. So what I was trying to say before was that um, some of the ideas around remixing in Scratch are inspired by what we saw outside Scratch. And in fact, you know, remixing is one of the activities that uh, I, I thought was really interesting that we see this across different media from painting, like the example that I have in the slider where, you know, you have the, that famous photograph of Marilyn Monroe being remixed over and over and over uh, throughout the, the years by different artists. But, you know, remixing is not only present in painting, it's also present, as we know, in music, for example. So one of the most fascinating examples that I remember seeing was the example of this song called the Amen Break. Uh, I don't know if you ever heard of it, uh, but uh, if you have heard commercials and, and songs from all over the world, they all use, a lot of them use um, this sample uh, back from the 60s. Uh, so again, the idea here is, you know, remixing is present in all sorts of creation. And so when we started to work on Scratch, um, you know, the, the idea of remixing was kind of uh, at the core of what we were trying to to support uh, as, as well as you know letting people express themselves creating uh, new things we also thought about the idea of connecting people via uh, remixing by you know letting people upload their own work and, and get inspire other people to create uh, so you know I, I think you know remixing although is is central to scratch it's also central to many other kinds of creation yeah. so I'm putting up the slide now that shows the trajectory over time the red line right. is showing how the number of projects uploaded to Scratch have grown over time. Now there's right. like about a couple thousand projects every day coming up. And then the, the blue or purple line is showing the number of remixes. I guess on the slide you show that like between a quarter and a third of all the projects that are uploaded mm -hmm. are remixed. Actually, I was curious, when we started, did, did you have a sense of how prevalent remixing would be? Is this in line with what you expected as we started the community? Yeah, I was hoping that we will have something like this, but I, I didn't have any particular numbers in mind. And in fact, one of the interesting things that I kind of I noticed from talking to other people who manage other systems is that the percentages are pretty similar to what we have. So I talked to this guy who runs this community for uh, sharing code for uh, processing, and they are also around the same, you know, 25 percent of, of, of all the total number of projects that they upload. Um, so you know, maybe that's kind of like standard in some ways. Yeah, well, these will be interesting things to see. There's so many new communities where this is happening now. I'm sure there's a lots of opportunities for studying and comparing between sites. I know one thing that's been interesting to us is ways in which remixing can provide a scaffolding as people are getting started. We heard from some of those quotes how people felt, some people found it easier getting started with remixing. And I know mm -hmm. you had sent along this graph that you would, as part of your study, you looked at how often people did remixing right at the beginning of their activity in Scratch. Right, and that's another aspect that, that it's really interesting to see how it's stayed pretty much stable since 2008. Uh, about 9% of projects, 9% of uh, people, uh, their first project was a remix. And about 25% of remixes are among the first five projects of people. So again, the idea here is that, you know, people, a lot of people, really do get started with remixing, although not everyone, uh, but a significant percentage of people, some of their first projects are remixes. And actually, I also have this quote there in the, uh, here. I, I was going to put it in a slide, but I'd rather read it uh, from a kid. I, he was a 12-year-old kid who said, you know, when I first started with Scratch, I didn't know much about it or how it worked, uh, he says. So I gave up on it. And then he says, a few years later, I decided to give Scratch another chance. And then he says, I knew, I knew from the start that I was going to make games. I was finished but not satisfied. The movement was choppy and, in my opinion, unacceptable. So I searched on the site for platforming games, and I found a nice one. And at that point, I had no clue what remixing was, but I planned to just copy the scripts block by block in another project uh, with credit given, of course, he says. Uh, and that's when I looked at the top left corner of the Scratch program 
and I noticed the share button was still there. So then I gave a quick look at the scripts and began making my game. And so he goes on and on and describes how he used this other person's project to create uh, this project after you know struggling uh, and work by working on his own. Yeah, so it really also then highlights the importance of having good ability to search out the things that you're interested in. So he was able to find something that was a good match for his interest and then was able to build on top of that. Right, right. Yeah, I know. So, so that's the point of how to help people get started and building on each other's. I know another thing that you've studied is how remi remixing can help ideas spread through the community of the people start with one mm -hmm. idea and then it spreads through the community and different, different you know, tricks of the trade or practices spread through the community through remixing. So maybe you could tell the story. Uh, you had sent along the slides, a visualization mm -hmm. of the project that got started uh, with you know, K-Doodle and how that spread mm -hmm. to different people within the community. Right, so this is an interesting, interesting sample because um, it was started by one project that was very, very simple and in some ways, uh, you know, didn't even work very well. And this is the Jumping Monkey by K-Doodle, uh, which was this monkey that, you know, you move around with the keyboard and you try to capture these bananas. Uh, but what was interesting is that as, as people start watching that project, uh, one of the people who, who looked at that project, uh, Mayhem, uh, this, other, this other person in the community, uh, this person decided to make some simple modifications, as he said in the comments, and added uh, this thing called pink slippers, as yeah. he called them. Right. So, uh, so, they, so it's pink slippers because he could then use the color to show whether it was touching the levels, right? <laughs> right, yeah. so he was very clever in making the game a little bit better by simply adding this, these screws on the, on the monkey so that he could detect uh, when the monkey was touching the black lines on the screen. Uh, so basically, you know, he made a little bit improvement and, and the game was a little bit better. And then this other person came, came uh, and, and joined the remix chain by, you know, uh, adding a couple of other things. And, and in this case, you know, I'm, I'm just going to quote from the comment. He says, how I made this project, I adapted this shoe technique from K Doodle's uh, Jumping Monkey. And then you can see there, you know, there is a lot more uh, sophistication to the game. There is there is some kind of a uh, fire that you're supposed to avoid. Uh, there is some music actually also that he added, like this song by uh, Johnny Cash. So it was a lot more uh, sophisticated kind of game, but still based on this technique of the pink slippers and the, the, the monkey, the, the, the jumping monkey that originated all these. Um, so then we what we see is, you know, there is a, a, another person, um, this, this, this kid, Dewey Bears, who found this game, the previous one, and uh, Dewey contacted the, the creator of the previous game and, and asked, you know, hey, Wiz, and this is the quote from the comments, is, I love this game, and I was wondering if you wouldn't mind me making some changes, As to which the other kid replied and says, hey, no problem. In fact, you know, I have this, this group that I'm creating uh, called uh, Super Software, and he calls it a company, uh, do you want to join, he asked. And, and so the two of them started to collaborate in making other games as well. Uh, and, and, you know, this is an example of how remixing started mainly as a kind of pragmatic kind of activity where this person just wanted the code and, and, the, and the files from the other person. He wanted the permissions, the files were there. And then that led to a collaboration later on that you know, led to many, many games. Um, and, and again, also the, the, that remix, the last one that I mentioned, the, they walk the line by uh, Dewey Birds. That one was extremely sophisticated. Uh, as you can see in the image, it looks a little bit like a Nintendo game. And that one led to many, many more remixes uh, just by the fact that this game was so sophisticated and people wanted to kind of jump on it. Yeah, those red dots on the visualization are all of the remixes that grew out of it. So it had thousands and thousands of views and then dozens and dozens of remixes that came out of right. it. Yeah. Right. Oh. Yeah, so I also think that you know, from that, we see several different forms of, you know, collaboration going on there. The remixing of building on each other's work was one form of collaboration. But then mm -hmm. another form was when they actually joined together and started working as a team in a collaboration to be able to, you know, uh, do projects together. So I see there's sort of different forms of collaboration that are happening within the community. Right. Right. So. Yeah, yeah. So I think one of the other fascinating things is to look at the different topologies of collaboration that we see through remixing. So in some cases, there is one project that gets remixed a lot by different people that add something small. And then there are other cases where it creates some kind of chain 
where you know one person remixes one project and that project is remixed again. Uh, so rather than a kind of like a star, you see this topology where it's more like a chain of, of a line of long remixes. Um, so I think you can also see the different kinds of projects that might lead to different kinds of topologies. Okay, Let, let's see if we now, if the technology is gonna allow us to bring Gerhard back into the conversation. Uh, so one of the issues to maybe put remixing into place is if you think about creativity, we, and we have specifically be interested in uh, social creativity, um, we can think about uh, that there is a distance, uh, distance in diversity which contributes to different... Uh, uh, so there are different ways uh, to think about the sources for creativity. And one is spatial distance. So people are at different places and they communicate with each other and later on we can look a little bit at projects like uh, SketchUp and Wikipedia. But then there is also temporal differences. So someone has done in the past and then people at a later point of time uh, continue to modify this and build on what people have uh, done in the past. And uh, this, I guess, was discussed by Andres about remixing. So one of the participants in the Scratch community has done something and other people uh, take advantage of one person has contributed. And uh, we have used other terms, or other people have used other terms like reuse, redesign, uh, and there has been, has been in computer science circles interest around uh, reuse libraries. This has become uh, is, is a research topic uh, investigated because you want to take advantage of what other people have contributed. Uh, then we can look at conceptual distances, meaning different people with different backgrounds bring different arguments to the table. And uh, maybe later on we can look, we have uh, constructed an environment, a tabletop computing environment, which, support, uh, which specifically supports that different people come with different insights, with different interests to the table to talk to each other. So we have looked into the sources for social creativity uh, and identified at least three different aspects. One is spatial, people being distributed at different locations. One is temporal, people dis being distributed over time. So I can build on what the people have done before me. And one is conceptual, where we can say people come from different backgrounds interdisciplinary work can be looked at this, and the value of interdisciplinary work comes that people bring different points of view to the table. Temporal and Temporal conceptual. And, conceptual. And we probably saw some of that in the remixing story that Andres told where a lot of it was temporal, uh, they were you know, scattered through space, and they came from different backgrounds, but uh, maybe Let's dive into, I know you also had uh, an example that you often talk about with SketchUp. Maybe you can say a little bit about, there's a, an ecosystem around SketchUp and the 3D warehouse where people are, are in, in some ways similar to, but different along some dimensions from the work that Andres was talking about. So maybe I can put up the slides. I have here with you know, the, the SketchUp. And if you can explain a little about how people are making these sort of visual representations, but then bring them together. Uh, maybe you could talk a little about that as, an, as, a, as another example. Uh, Actually, what I'm going to suggest is, I think this might be a good time. As I mentioned, we were going to try to get more you know, participation from people in the course. So I think this might be a good time to, to jump in and do that. What I was going to suggest is that you know, this week, some of you did have the chance to remix with Scratch. But other of you have, have probably had other types of remixing experiences, uh, whether it's remixing online of building off other people's work and uh, to things that you do not necessarily online, in everyday life of building on uh, you know, 
the work of others, whether it's taking some images and enhancing the images of others, or, or even just taking ideas of others. You, if you're taking someone's recipe and enhancing someone's recipe, that too is a type of remix. I think what would be interesting to talk about is your experience with remixing and how you saw the learning experience that accompanied that. So if you're doing a scratch project by building on someone else, how does that compare to starting your own scratch project from a blank slate? If you're remixing a recipe and you're building on someone else's recipe versus just experimenting uh, you know, uh, from a blank slate in the kitchen. So maybe think about a remixing experience that you had and think about the learning that went with it. If you're watching this along with someone else, talk to somebody else that you're with. Otherwise, we'd encourage you to go to the chat room at candy.media.mit.edu and start sharing it, or in the Google Plus community. Go to the Google Plus community and start sharing some of your you know, experiences of learning through remixing. So it's not just about when you remixed, but think about your learning experience through remixing and how does it compare to other learning experiences? In what ways did remixing open up new learning opportunities or did in some ways hamper the learning opportunities because you felt like you were just copying someone else and not really learning anything. So talk a little about your experiences of learning through remixing, uh, either with other people you're with physically, in the chat, or in the Google Plus community. And in about five minutes, we'll reconnect, and hopefully by then be able to continue the conversation with Andres and Gerhardt. So Gerhard. I'm, I'm afraid the technology prob problems continue. So I think we're going to, we, we're hopefully the, the video, Gerhardt and Andres won't see the video, but hopefully the People in the class are still picking up the video. And uh, unfortunately, we won't be able to see Gerhard and Andres for the rest of the session, but we do have them on the phone now. So we'll be able to continue with the phone conversation. Hopefully, the participants in the class just spent some time talking about issues around learning through remixing. And maybe we can chat a little bit about that. Uh, I know sometimes the question comes up when people hear about remixing. Oftentimes, we hear this from educators who have a real concern that you know, they worry that remixing is just going to be people copying what someone else has done. And there's some ethical issues with that, just handing it in. But even aside from that, they worry, are people really learning things as they just are sort of taking what others have done and making a slight tweak to it, uh, and maybe not understanding what it is they're reusing? Uh, maybe you could each talk a little about that, about what you see as some of the issues of to what extent, you know, as people remix, it supports learning, but also what are the risks that it can undermine certain aspects of understanding or learning? I know, do you have thoughts on that, Gerhard? Yeah, I mean, we looked for a long time, or I gave it uh, a paper, uh, I gave a paper for the students to read, which was called In Defense of Cheating by Don Norman. And I mean, he raised the issue of uh, that remixing can be understood. You just copy other people's work. You even, uh, don't even acknowledge it rather than you see it as an opportunity to build on other people's work. I mean, Andres, obviously you've had to think about this a lot in the context of Scratch, but also in other contexts. You know, how, how do you respond to that when educators ask you that question? Yeah, I mean, I think part of the issue is um, you know, what, what is it that people are trying to achieve. And to me, if remixing allows the student to achieve whatever his or her goal is, uh, then, you know, I, I think it's, 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 it's okay. And, and I think that teachers do focus more on um, the idea of, you know, figuring out, giving that, perhaps if, if there, there's some kind of homework, that uh, remixing could be an actual productive uh, activity. So, for example... If the task is too simple and, and you know, just copying somebody else's work uh, is, is enough, then maybe the, the problem is with the task, not with remixing itself. Uh, so I do think that, uh, you know, perhaps at the beginning, obviously, tasks, simple tasks are fine. But as to progress, you know, giving tasks that require complexity and perhaps remixing from different sources, um, I think that that's probably a better approach than trying to chase the never-ending, you know, goal of trying to prevent uh, copying and cheating, I think just kind of embedding it as part of the activity is probably a better approach. You're saying that it's probably a lot of tasks that have been given in the past are just information retrieval tasks. And if information retrieval now becomes trivial, uh, then 
uh, we need different sorts of tasks. Uh, to, to, that, that wasn't necessarily the, the best way of learning anyway. Right. Uh, and well, I think it depends a lot of, on, on the problem which you try to solve. If you give students as homework a problem to solve a mathematical proof which has one answer, then yes, you you want to engage people in individual problem-solving activities. If the problem-solving activities consist of bringing different points of view together, debating this, it's a totally different situation. Maybe there's a good launching point. Gerhard, you were mentioning earlier, I'm going to bring up the slides, with one of the projects that you had worked on, uh, the Envisionment and Discovering Collaboratory was specifically designed to bring together people with different points of view. So this is another yeah. dimension of social creativity. When you had mentioned, you know, social creativity could be involved people separated by space, by time, or sort of conceptual understanding. So I think this was yeah. one effort where you were trying to bring together people uh, from different backgrounds as an important way of supporting and fostering, you know, creativity. Yeah, that diversity and distance, uh, distance in a conceptual sense, temporal sense, spatial sense, are sources of creativity. You want to bring as many different points of view to bear on an interesting problem. Yeah, so and maybe you could say a little bit like in this particular case, so this was a case where you were doing it wasn't necessarily online. A lot of the things that we talk about these days because so many new opportunities are opened up by connecting people at a distance, as in the Scratch community in most cases, uh, or people putting together Wikipedia articles, is people in different places oftentimes contributing. Yeah. But in this case, with what the EDC, it was more people were at the same place, but coming from different backgrounds. Uh, that was That's a different right. dimension. So maybe you could say a little bit about your thinking in developing that project. Yeah. So shall I talk about the EDC? Yes. Okay, so uh, I assume that the audience sees a slide of a, a system which we built for many years called the Envisionment and the Discovery Collaboratory. And it's a slightly different project than the Scratch project because in this case, People are physically co-present, they gather around a computationally enhanced table, and the sources of creativity come that the participants come from different backgrounds. There may be a professional urban planner, there may be a person who represents the city, there are neighborhood uh, associations who want to have a voice. And each of these people argue from different points of view. And so I think in today's world, we overemphasize uh, or lost a little bit sight that there are numerous possibilities supporting social creativity among people who are in the same room, at the same place. In technologies like tabletop computing environments can help to support uh, people who are co-present to come up with more interesting and more creative solutions. Maybe I know, I think you passed along slides of one of the examples of the, the ways in which they had worked together uh, with the EDC. Yeah, I think people, for example, we studied urban planning situations and people wanted to debate uh, to establish a new bus route and where the bus, stop, the bus stops should be. And each one could articulate how long they would be willing to walk. And the system technologically supported walking circles for each individual participant. And over time, as people collaborated, it created an image which showed the most promising location for bus stops. And we argued in the analysis that this image did not exist in any individual mind, but was an outcome of the interaction, bringing different points of view, different preferences together, 
in their biases this served as a source of creativity. Right. And I do think there's, I think it's, it's useful to think about there's a whole, so many different types of ways people can come together to work on things. As you said, this is partly that they're there co-located, people coming together from different backgrounds, but it's also a small group of people, small team collaboration can have a very different feel from there's a lot of work online now where you bring thousands of people together on something. So I think you see different uh, advantages of the, the different ways of having people come together. Yeah, without a doubt. I think uh, the other example which we started to talk about, about up, you want to model every building in the world in 3D. And this is obviously you want to have participation rates of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. But I think what we should try to understand is that there are a lot of different kinds of problems, and we should come up with an understanding how social creativity can come alive in very different settings. Um, maybe one thing that uh, I think both of you have been thinking about is designing for social creativity. It's like in case of you, you know, Andres, you were sort of designing for remixing uh, and designing for other forms of collaboration as well. I wonder, Andres, if you could share a little bit about some of your lessons learned as a designer. You know, as you move forward, are there other things that you would do? What do you think worked best? What didn't work as well? If you were designing other systems to support social interaction, what are some of the lessons learned as you were you know, thinking about on the design side? Right, so I think one of the, the lessons for me at this was that uh, when I was thinking about remixing when we started, I was thinking of it more of an activity uh, that will allow people to achieve a particular goal. So a very pragmatic way of thinking, and this comes a lot from the you know, traditions of remixing and programming where you, know, you might want to reuse somebody else's library or somebody else's code in order to achieve a particular goal. But one thing that I didn't think about when we started, and that I think is really important when thinking about remixing, is that remixing is also a kind of community-building activity. Uh, so through remixing, people establish you know, collaborative uh, relationships, but also in general, you know, the relationships with other people uh, in the community um, by, by, by creating things together. So, you know, as we as I reflect back on, on the activities that happen in the Scratch community and in other communities, I think for designers, it's really important to consider remixing as both a community building activity as well as a more pragmatic activity. Uh, so insofar that the technology support both kinds of interaction, I think we'll see a lot more, uh, you, you get a lot more from, from remixing than simply thinking about people achieving particular goals. Output of remixing is not just the products the result, but the community is the result. Exactly, yes. Yeah. Um, and well, <clears throat> yeah, I think what we have uh, tried uh, or thought, established a framework for, was for a concept which we call meta design. And what it means in short is design for designers. And so, for example, with my own teaching activities, I developed a concept for many years, which I call courses as speeds. And the intention is that speeds. I, as the instructor, construct a seed, which the students actively contribute to extend the seed. So I am the meta designer, design an, envi I design an environment which all participants, the course participants, actively contribute. And when Mitch spoke at the beginning of today's session, uh, he said that some of you felt unhappy about that this course is too much instruction, is too much one directional. And our concept of courses as seeds is designed for creativity that we intentionally say we only design seeds rather than complete products which are delivered to the audience. 
And this holds for many this other situations, like the people at SketchUp designed an environment in which all other people can contribute their product, their buildings which they model. Right, so that idea of specifically designing things that are uh, starting points for others, uh, make it yes. easy for others to build on and to, to evolve. I think in the Scratch community, I think maybe there are two different levels we've seen that, Andres. There's Scratch itself was a seed that some people have remixed Scratch and done alternate versions of Scratch. So Scratch itself was a seed for other people to remix. But then also in the Scratch community, I think maybe if you could tell the story how, I remember after Scratch had already launched, we decided to give some prominence on the homepage to the projects that were most remixed. So that then led people to think about how could they make projects that others would be interested in remixing. So they were in some ways creating seeds the way, uh, the way that Gerhardt was talking about. So maybe you can talk about some right. of the changes through the, through the history of the Scratch community. Right, so as you mentioned, uh, you know, when we first started with Scratch, uh, one of the things that we saw emerging was remixing, remixing itself. And so we, we noticed people in some cases being really excited about remixing, but in other cases not so much, and people being concerned about other people taking their work. So as a result of that, we decided to implement on the front page the ability to show the most remixed projects as a way to kind of give back to those who are being remixed a lot and perhaps, you know, inspiring people to, to remix in a positive way, or at least to perceive remixing more positively. And the outcome of this was not only that you know, remixing became more prominent, but also that, you know, in some cases people might perceive uh, remixing as an activity worthy of encouraging in their creations. So we started seeing a lot of people who were creating projects explicitly so that other people remix them. Um, so, you know, we started seeing things like, you know, projects that say something like, uh, remix this if you agree with, you know, uh, supporting animal rights, for example, or remix this if you really like Pokemon. Um, so you, we start seeing kids uh, really engaging this idea of creating highly generative works by figuring out what are the topics or what are the techniques that might encourage other people to take those projects and remix them, uh, which is something that, uh, that was really surprising. Sometimes people might critique it by saying, as people specifically try to make things remixed, uh, whether that really leads to greater creativity or not. Uh, I know that, you know, the, the, well, I, like in the Scratch community, whether those projects that are meant to be remixed, does that lead to more creativity or not? Uh, what's your view on sort of the quality of, of creativity that comes out of that? Right. So, I mean, this is a highly debated topic in the community itself, in the Scratch community. and. I don't think this is the right answer. And I think, you know, remixing encompasses a wide range of activities. Um, so in some cases, uh, as I mentioned before, you know, when it's more about community building, um, the act of remixing itself, you know, in terms of what you're producing, might be very small. In terms of community building, you're actually joining a conversation by adding something small to a larger remix chain. But in other cases, as I mentioned, uh, you know, these small uh, remixes it might lead to connections with people that might lead to more you know, deep and complex uh, relationships in terms of creating things with other people. So, you know, some people found each other through remixing, through these simple types of remixing, but then, you know, engage in more complex activity by joining groups and collaborations and companies, as the kids call them. Uh, so, so I think, you know, one of the challenges with remixing is that uh, it just represents a wide range of activities. In some cases, activities that are not very complex, but that lead to more complex activities via the community and building and relationship building that I think is also representative of remixing. It could be a role for educators of how to help people explore different roles that they can take on from sort of the, the, the simplest forms of participation to more you know, significant ways of engaging and learning through it. I know Gerhardt, in your paper, you talked about a whole sort of series of levels of participation with the meta designer being at one point, but then sort of the real peripheral participant at another. And it would seem that one role that educators can think about is how they can support people as they engage in different and participate in different ways. Do you have, maybe you can talk a little bit about those different 
sort of layers of participation and ways of supporting and encouraging uh, different forms. Yeah, I, I think we have talked over the last few minutes a lot about potentially technical aspects of free mixing and social creativity. I think there is a big element of the social setting and how do we value different activities. And if you think about some classroom situation, if people collaborate, it's treated as cheating rather than working together. And as long as this mindset exists among teachers as well as students, uh, we will not create the foundation for social creativity. So we looked into different participation patterns. And for example, I assume most of you are familiar with Wikipedia. So you can just be a reader of Wikipedia. You can become a slightly more demanding activity. You can create spelling errors in an existing uh, document. Uh, one level up is that you add a paragraph that you correct an uh, incorrect date, and eventually you, you create your own article. Uh, and then there are the people who create Wikipedia as such, and those in our terminology are the meta designers. And this way of different uh, levels of participation, we have, some of my PhD students have investigated this in the context of open, open source community where we could identify 10 different roles which people were willing to take, each associated with different opportunities and different demands. Okay. Um, I think maybe that's sort of a, a good place to end up on, because I do think that one of the things that's worthy to continue to explore is all those different levels of participation. And I really like Gerhardt's point that it's not just about the technical infrastructure to support it. There is a lot of focus these days as you know, computational networks be, you know, proliferate and the ease of collaboration and remixing you know, comes into play. Uh, that gets a lot of the attention. But I think one thing we want to continue to think about as we think about creative learning experiences is the, sort of the social infrastructure around it, both how we can sort of support different attitudes towards remixing and collaboration, uh, and how we can sort of foster people as they explore different roles within uh, you know, creative collaboration activities. Uh, some of these- you know, So maybe if, if I can just add one comment, uh, from my side, uh, technology didn't work too in a wonderful way. I hope that all you out uh, who participate in this uh, class will still have learned a little bit. But let me recommend if anything, what I said was of interest to you, you can go to my homepage and there are articles about meta design, courses as seed, many of the things which we discussed today. And hopefully, despite the technical difficulties, uh, some of the ideas got across. We appreciate your patience in putting up with the technical difficulties. It's, uh, this class is an experiment along many dimensions. One is technological, uh, but also it's the pedagogical as well. And uh, so hopefully we'll continue to experiment along both direction, dimensions to try to get the technology in place and, and keep on experimenting with the best way of engaging people. As I said in the very beginning, I think the theme of this week's social creativity is very relevant for the class. That, uh, I think oftentimes the MOOCs of today aren't thinking enough in terms of social creativity. And I think one thing we want to do in this class is to continue to think how we can support people working together and learning from one another as part of, of online uh, classes like this. Um, as one of those experiments, is the chat, are there still people in the chat despite the technical difficulties? So maybe if Gerhard, I want to thank Gerhard and Andres for joining today. They will be able to stay around for a little while longer and joining in candy.media.mit.edu for 
those of you who have stuck with us through the technology problems, you know, you know, check out the chat room. Andres and Gerhardt will join there, and you can continue the conversation with them and ask them some questions directly there. Uh, in the meantime, we'll give a little look ahead for next week, uh, or actually two weeks from now. One point is next week is MIT spring break, so there'll be no class next week on March 25th. The next time we get together will be on April 1st, two weeks from today. The theme of the week will be learning in communities, and uh, Natalie Rusk will be taking the lead on uh, facilitating that week. So I'll ask Natalie to give you a little preview about the, the course for the class two weeks from today. Yeah, so we'll be talking a little bit about um, how the Computer Clubhouse got started and the principles that we developed as part of it, but then how people are remixing those ideas, applying those principles in different contexts and building on them. And Geeta Narayanan will be joining us from India, from Bangalore, and talking about how she's just taken ideas and she's doing some really interesting things right now with meetups, uh, a, a new group she started, Bangalore Steamers, that's on a meetup, and also just ways that she's within her local community set up both centers and then now these kind of pop-up um, meetups. So I think it'll be really interesting. And then, let's see, um, as part of it too, I think we'll really be interested for people um, here and then uh, in the online space to go look in your local community, to go visit a maker space or some other kind of learning creative learning space. And if you're already part of one, then really to share it, your experience in there, what is it like, how can you participate, either as a mentor where youth are, or for yourself or both. Um, and we'll be interested to hear. Oh yeah, and just mentioning that one place to look for those is on, there's a maker space uh, we'll, we'll, um, website that we can share. And then, um, as an example, Miriam Marcus in the online community, during the chat session, um, Philip and others were talking about uh, the space in a hacker space in Detroit called OmniCore. So she thought, okay, maybe I'll go check it out. And, and people asked her to report back, which she did. And she talked about, you know, what was like at the sensory experience. And, um, and then Martin Dillon shared one in Seattle. So we're interested in, if there is one, you know, to go visit it, if you're already part of one, to share about it, or even start up your own meetup or figure out what you want to do around making, get a group together. So, and we'll be interested. I think we'll really want to pull those in to share that next week. Uh, not next week, two weeks from now. Yeah. And then just to wrap up one final logistics point, uh, we will do a rebroadcast of today's session. Uh, and actually, the Every, but from my understanding is, although some of you had problems with the video in the first part, the rebroadcast will have a better video uh, to, to throughout. Uh, so the rebroadcast was intended specifically for the European audience, because this time oftentimes isn't great for some of them. So it'll be a, a rebroadcast at 6 p.m. Central European time uh, tomorrow on March 19th. So check out your time converters if you want to. Uh, look at elsewhere in the world, but 6 p.m. Central European time. We'll put more information in the Google Plus community. So if you want to check out that European broad rebroadcast, we'll check the staff announcements in the, on, in the Google Plus community. Also, if you're from Asia and you would like to coordinate a rebroadcast there and to pick a time, let us know and we can work with you on that. So with that, again, sorry for the technical difficulties today. Uh, Hope you, you know, still enjoyed the conversation with Gerhard and Andres, and we look forward to reconnecting with you two weeks from today on April 1st for another session, uh, this time focusing on learning in communities of, of learning creative learning. Thanks for joining us.